as the Reverend Dr. Bobby said, is Eric Taylor, and I am very grateful to be here sharing God's word with you all. Um, we are so excited. This is our first time in Kenya, and we love it. It's been, it's been a wonderful experience. Today, our topic is living in true worship. Uh, what does it mean to live in true worship? Um, and as we read in Romans 12, 1 through 2. So I will read that again, and then we will we'll discuss what this means. Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. My question, what does it mean to live in true worship? We can see the answer right in this passage. A different translation says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. True and proper worship. But what, what does this mean? Church, brothers and sisters, true worship is giving all that we are to God. True worship is giving ourselves to God. In this passage, Paul gives us two practical ways to become a living sacrifice, to worship truly. And we will explore these together. The first way is to not be conformed to the world. And the second is to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Do not be conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewal of our minds. But before that, we must look at the foundation of this passage. When looking at a passage, it's necessary to understand what's going on around it. And in this case, we're in the 12th chapter of Romans, and the author, Paul, he wrote a lot before this. We see in this passage the words, therefore, and by the mercies of God, or in view of God's mercy. So, so what is Paul talking about? What mercy? Paul wrote a lot about God's mercy in the chapters before this. And truly, the book of Romans can be divided into two main parts. The first half, 1 through 11, is a presentation, an explanation of God's mercy, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And the second, the chapters 12 through 16, is an application of how does this matter in our lives. And we are in the very beginning of that application. So, let's back up just a little bit to understand what Paul was saying. So please flip with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Romans 5, 6 through 11. And I will read that now. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the heart of, we, of what we believe as Christians. We are all sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. But through one man, one perfectly righteous man, we can be righteous. Jesus Christ is that man. Jesus died for our sins. And this is the foundation of what we need to know in Romans 12. To be able to understand what it means to live in true worship, we must understand what Jesus Christ did for us. He, the Son of God, came down to earth from his place in heaven. He took on flesh and became like us. He lived a perfect life, and he died a perfect death. He lived the life we could not live. And he was beaten and mocked and killed. 
He hung on the cross so that those who believe could have faith in Him can have eternal life. Jesus' message was to repent and follow Him. Turn from sin and follow His perfect ways. And those who do that, who repent and follow Him, will have eternal life through His righteousness, not our own. Through our own efforts, we will never be righteous. We can only be right if we are covered by the blood of our beautiful Savior. Brothers and sisters, the gospel, the good news, is not something that only those who don't believe need to hear. But we need it. Christians need the gospel. We need it every day. It gives us life. It gives us hope. It gives us faith. That Jesus Christ died for sinners. So we need that message every day. It rightly puts our eyes and our hearts towards God. So, with this as our foundation, let's move into Paul's commands for how we are to live in true worship. So number one, we are to live in true worship by not conforming to this world. We live in true worship by not being conformed to the patterns of this world. Do not be conformed. Do you see it? Right here in, in chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Paul is instructing us to live in a way that is not conformed to how the world, sin, lives. Now, in my context, in the United States, it might look slightly different than it might look here in Machacos. But sin is sin no matter where we are. Sin is sin no matter where we are. And I believe that's what Paul is getting at. We, as Christians, those saved by Jesus' blood, must not live in the sinful ways that the world lives. We live in the world, but we don't live of the world. We don't live the way the world lives. And I want to make this clear. This isn't optional. This isn't uh, a choice we get to make. But when we are Christians, we are changed. The Holy Spirit resides in us. And this is what happens as a result of that. Now, there are many ways that we can become conformed to the world. And we'll discuss some of those. But to me, there is one passage of scripture that explains this very clearly and very well. And that is Psalm 1. Please listen to this first verse of Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the way, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of the mockers. We can take this, this first verse and see what conforming to the world is. It's the opposite of the blessed one. Conforming to the world is the one who does walk in step with the wicked, the one who does stand in the way that sinners take, the one who does sit in the company of mockers. Psalm 1 then goes on to explain that the result of this is being like chaff that's blown away in the wind and that it leads to destruction. Now, I'd like to spend some time talking about specific ways that we might be conforming to the world. Some ways are obvious, and some are not. One way that we conform to the world is by who we spend most of our time with. When we spend a lot of time with people that have not been faith in Jesus, but who are actually outspoken in their sin, that can damage us. As humans, we're easily influenced especially by those we are closest to. When people we are close to are mocking, scoffing, and giving wicked deeds, whether by actions, words, or thoughts, how do we respond? Do we join them and sin with them and conform and look like them? No, we can't. As Christians, we must be careful who we spend our time with, and we must be careful how we act with people that are not Christians. Now, I want to be clear, I want to clarify, we are supposed to love and spend time with people who are not Christians. And we are to show them the love of Christ in everything. We must be a good witness to them. But we must be on guard as we can easily fall and begin to look like them the more we are with them. We need to think deeply about the people closest to you in our lives. But whether they are Christian or not, show them the love of God, the love that He has given us, and the love that we can show. I'd like to give a brief example of what I, what I want to communicate um, in my context, of conforming to the world, in my context, in the United States. The high school I went to, the secondary school I went to, was a small Christian school. It was, it was a great school that 
that try to teach us who God is. And in America, the United States, it's very common for people, after they graduate high school, to go to university uh, far away across the country, uh, on the other side of the country, away from their friends, away from their families, and away from their church community. And I know many people, even some of my friends in high school, who did this, who went away to a university far away. And when they came back, they were different people. I didn't know them anymore. Before, they were surrounded by Christians and church at school, and we didn't know who they were. But when they came, but when they were away at university, their classmates would invite them to something like a, a party or a nightclub, and they would slowly, they would say no at first, but they would slowly begin to say yes and yes and conform. They would slowly, little by little, they went on more and more and sinned more and more, conforming to the pattern of this world by doing things they never would have believed that they would ever do when they were here before they went to university. Things like going to nightclubs, getting drunk, and being sexually immoral, that became normal. They conformed to the pattern of this world. To clarify, this isn't always the case in the United States, but it, it, it happens often. And I believe that we can feel this in our own lives even if in a smaller way. When we spend a lot of time with someone, we begin to talk like they talk, think like they think, and see the world in the way that they see the world. And this can be a great thing. If we're spending our time with people whose loves and affections are towards God, that can influence us. That is wonderful. That's what church is. But it can also be dangerous. Now, another way that we can easily conform to the pattern of this world is through media, internet, television. When we spend so much time consuming simple media and we're not filling ourselves up with what we need to fill up, it strengthens our flesh's hold over us. And we see this increasing everywhere. Um, the pattern of this world is the pattern of our flesh. Our sinful flesh loves sin. That's why it's so hard for us to give it up. And honestly, this will be a battle for the rest of our lives. However, God does not leave us alone in this battle against our sinful nature and in this sinful world. Because to live in true worship, we cannot be to this world. And he calls us to live in true worship. Thankfully, God provides a way of escape to being conformed to the world. Because the second way we live in true worship is by being transformed by the renewal of our minds. The second way we live in true worship is by being transformed by the renewal of our minds. Listen again to verse 2 in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We live in true worship by being transformed by the renewal of our minds. What does this mean? What does, what does this actually mean? Christians, we know that we are not yet perfect. We are still battling our sinful flesh. And this will continue until we see the Lord Jesus, whether by his death, our death, or his return. However, we can be transformed now. And if you are a Christian, you are transformed now. But this process called sanctification continues for our whole lives, us being made perfect like him. And the primary way we are transformed is through this book, the Bible. The Holy Spirit changes us, changes our longings, our desires, our, our wants, as we read and listen to his word, both in devotional times and also through the preaching of the word. One way to think of it that I think is very clear is like pottery. When a uh, potter molds something, um, he shapes it and fashions it to be the way that he wants it to be. God is the potter, like the prophet in the Jeremiah says, and we are the clay. And through reading his word, he can shape us, cut off what shouldn't be there, and mold us to look more like what we were created to look like. Earlier, we read a bit of Psalm 1 to illustrate. Now please flip with me in your Bibles to Psalm 1, and let's read the whole psalm together. Psalm 1.
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What a beautiful passage of Scripture. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. The one who does this prospers. They are not like the chaff that the wind drives away. But they are firmly rooted and yield fruit. Brothers and sisters, may we be like this. May our delight be in the law of the Lord. We see here that the delight of the blessed is in the law of the Lord. The Word of God, it gives us life. It gives us strength. Brothers and sisters, we need the Word of God. It's God's Word. This is how He has chosen to communicate with us. And it is refreshing and gives life to our downcast souls. It rightly points our hearts to God in all that we do. It keeps our minds on Him and renews us. It makes us new. It makes us as we were created to be. The Bible does so much in us as we read it. The prophet Isaiah writes of God, saying, You, God, keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. When our minds are ready to focus on God, we are kept in perfect peace. Our anxiety and our feels, fears fall before our loving and gracious God, who gives us the medicine that we need. And we can live in true worship. What a wonderful God we have. Another way to think of the Bible is like food. We need food every day. It sustains us. It gives us life. The Word of God gives us life. It sustains us through all of our trials. Another aspect of renewing our minds comes through community, church. We see in Psalm 1 that the righteous does not walk in step with the wicked. The righteous does not walk in step with the wicked. However, we must put our delight in the law of the Lord. At the same time, we need to be surrounded by and encourage other Christian brothers and sisters. God gave us the church. God gave us community to help guide us. What a gift from God. In Hebrews we read, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Christians, we must stir one another up to love God, to love one another, and to love good works. The meeting on the Lord's Day is a gift from God. We must not neglect it, but cherish it. When we spend time with other believers, our priorities and our focuses are made right when we come together, striving to love God and our neighbors together until that day comes when we see God face to face in our imperfect community. In our passage, Romans 12, we also see the result of being renewed. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we are transformed through the renewal of our minds, we can then test and discern what is the will of God the will of God for our lives is what is good, pleasing, and perfect. He reveals His will to us in His Word. So, we can test everything that we see and everything we encounter under the authority of God's Word. When we are not sure if a teaching is right, we can test it to God's Word. And we can discern whether or not it is the will of God. This is so important in terms of doctrine. 
beliefs of God, false teaching exists everywhere. Here in Kenya and back in the United States, everywhere across the world, false teaching exists. This is harmful and it stops us from being renewed. When we believe false teaching, we're not being renewed. We need to know God's word, to be able to identify, to see false teaching. And there's one thing that all false teaching has in common, and it's this. It is not aligned with what this life-giving book is. And false teaching doesn't give us the life that this book does. Some examples of false teachings and how the word of God can rightly focus us. False teachings say, you must earn your salvation. We know this is false, because Ephesians 2 tells us that our salvation is a gift from God, not a result of our works. The blood of Jesus saves us. That the Bible is so clear on that. Another false teaching says, if you have enough faith, you will be rich. We know that this is a lie, because Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money. Also, we know that the love of money leads to all kinds of evil. And the Bible does promise us spiritual wealth, not material wealth, but spiritual wealth, blessings, perfect peace. Another example, false teachings say, I believe in Jesus because my family does, but I don't need to change, and I can keep living for myself. And no, this is a lie, because the Bible is clear that it's wonderful to have a family that knows Jesus, but we personally must have a relationship with Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we love Jesus, we will strive to follow him, to keep his commandments. Our family's faith cannot save us. We need our own faith. And this doesn't mean that we won't sin. We still will sin and make mistakes until we see Jesus. But it does mean that when we are saved, we have the spirit inside of us to help us, to encourage us, and to convict us. There are so many, so many false teachings. And the Word of God will rightly teach us the truth in spite of all of the world's lies trying to take over us. Brothers and sisters, let us be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Let us be transformed by God's Word. And when our minds are renewed and we are transformed, God rightly becomes our first priority in our lives. He is but most important to us. And when God is most important to us, He is rightly where He should be in our lives. Everything else in our life also rightly aligns. When God is our first priority, we know who He is, the true God, the God of the Bible, when He is first in our lives, and we believe what He has said, and we have a relationship with Him, Everything, all other priorities are also rightly aligned. We love our wives, uh, we love our kids better, we love our community better, we do, we serve better. Everything, our peace, we have peace in God when He is in His first priority, He is number one in our lives. When we renew our minds on the Word of God, our anxiety lessens because we know when we read the Word that He keeps us in perfect peace when our minds are stayed on Him, Isaiah 26, 3 through 4. Our fear, listen to this, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Isaiah 41, 10. Our trust, back to Isaiah 26, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. We can trust Him. He is an everlasting, unchanging, steady, faithful rock. Brothers and sisters, I hope you can see that when we are renewing our minds on this Word, on the Bible, on God's Word, it transforms us, it changes us, and it makes us live in true worship. True worship is giving all that we are to God. And to do this, we must not conform to the simple world, and we must be transformed by the renewal of our minds. How we see the world when we know the Bible, how we see the world, it becomes through the way that God sees the world. We can love what He loves, hate what He hates. We can love people 
when we know that they are created by God in the image of God, and we can share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Brothers and sisters, we must be true in our worship in all that we do. Run to God, not to the world, and find your ultimate joy and satisfaction in Him alone by giving all that you are to our supreme God. Steady on, keep going, and find God in His Word. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word, which steadies us, which guides us, which we know is sure. Thank you for how you have loved us, how you have shown who you are in your word, and that we can know who you are. We can have a relationship with you, the God of the universe. God, I pray that you help this church, help us, Lord, to be able to discern what your will is by reading your word, by listening to the preaching of your word. God, I pray that you help us not conform to the world. When the world tells us something, Lord, help us to find the truth in your word. Lord, you have been so giving, you have been so kind. Thank you for how you have loved us. Lord, I pray for this church, Lord, that they know you more and more every day, that they find their perfect peace in you alone, that their anxiety falls before you, our holy, loving God. Father, I pray for uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Bondi, God, as he leads this church, and as he leads and preaches, Lord, I pray that he can faithfully preach your word so that people can find their full satisfaction in you alone. I pray for Dr. Bondi and his family and all of the pastors at this church, Lord, that they may guide, Lord, guide, guide the flock to you. I pray for the congregation, Lord, that they can find their ultimate joy and satisfaction and live in true worship, in perfect worship for you, God. And Lord, I pray against all false teachings, both here in Kenya and in the United States, that I pray against the teachings of the prosperity gospel, that Lord, you, you alone give us spiritual love, Lord, that you do not promise us material love. Lord, I pray for salvation in this church, for those who do not know you, salvation in this city, in Metropolis, and salvation in Kenya, God. I pray that true doctrine be spread, that Jesus Christ died for us. Thank you for this truth, that you saved us. Thank you for saving us by your Son's blood. You gave your Son so that we could know you. We could have everlasting, eternal life. What a gift. There is nothing worth more than knowing you. God, I pray for this church. I pray for everyone in this church, Lord, that this week they may focus on you, 